And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 3.30. Stay tuned next for Making Contact. This hierarchy of human life where if you are a woman of color and you're impoverished, you're at the very bottom and your life is seen as not worth anything. That's Margaret Prescott, the founder of the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders. This is Making Contact. I'm Laura Flynn. And I'm Jasmine Lopez. On today's show, we're going to talk about this hierarchy and how it relates to dehumanization, which means we should warn you, today's show is heavy. So if you have kids around, or if you may be triggered by stories about violence, you may want to sit this one out. So Jasmine, I've been reading this book by David Livingston Smith called Less Than Human. Smith writes about how dehumanization has been used throughout time to justify slavery and ethnic cleansing. Like European colonialists referring to Native Americans as savages? Exactly. Smith basically says this sort of dehumanization feeds on racism. And when used on a whole group of people, it's usually a signal to extreme violence. So that's what we're talking about today. We're going to explore how some women have been dehumanized to the point of indifference. First, let's go to Oakland, California. Making Contact's fellow, Rochelle Robinson, brings us this story exploring how violence against women, especially women of color, is so pervasive that we're numbed into thinking it's nothing less than normal. While the homicide rate for black women has decreased over the years nationwide, in 2010, the rate was twice as high for black women than all female victims combined. In this story, the first voice you'll hear is Kimberly Smith and then Rochelle as they talk about their own rushes with death. I was in my 30s, and I met a young man. I was about 19 when I also met a young man. And he picked me up, and next thing I knew, he had a gun to my head. Before you knew it, we were married, and a few months later, he was threatening my life with the gun. I ran for my life, and he followed. The police, when they came to help, I thought... They just came asking me why was I in that place at that time. And I was trying to explain to them I thought I was on a date. And they kind of looked at me like I was a street walker. I made attempts to leave him, but he started threatening my family. There would be no official report of his physical and sexual violence. And I just didn't trust the police. I was too afraid to tell anyone what he'd been doing to me. So I hid my fear and his abuse while knowing it wouldn't end. I just felt my life didn't matter. So I got no assistance. They took no reports. They didn't pursue the man. Uh, Three months later, he had murdered. The girl tried to fight back. She didn't get away like I did. That's Kimberly Smith. She and I have experienced life-threatening violence and have lived to tell it. I met Smith at a park in Oakland, California. And we were both drawn to the story of another young black woman whose experience was not so different from ours. Robertson, Kimberly Lachey, 23, was born September 1, 1990, at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. She departed this life on Saturday, April 5, 2014, in Oakland, California. That's from Kimberly Robertson's obituary. The night she died, the weather was typical for that time of year, about 46 degrees and dry. She left the local bar around 2 a.m., and while waiting for a bus home, witnesses say Robertson entered a red Toyota SUV. That same vehicle was later seen leaving the area where her body had been found by a bicyclist several hours later. She had been raped and beaten in the head. The man believed responsible has been arrested. Robertson's death was quietly dismissed by the media and community at large. It was a quotidian experience in the life of a black woman. We're totally omitted from the newspaper headlines. We're totally omitted from the murals, from the billboards, from the discussion entirely. That's Gabrielle Ray Travis. She's the outreach coordinator for her resilience. They're using art and activism to bring attention to violence against women in Oakland. 
They gave 12 artists wood panels to paint a mural of the likenesses of women who survived and those who died at the hands of violence. And this way, women like Kimberly Robertson become more than just Oakland's 26 homicide victim in 2014. One of my biggest hang-ups was Kimberly Robertson because she so inspired this mural. To know that she had been violated in that way, to know that she was a mother and that she came here not that long before, it really disturbed us. As the outreach coordinator, Travis set out to find women to represent in the mural, including contacting Kimberly Robertson's family. Getting in touch with her family, and unfortunately, that was something we were never able to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Travis spent countless hours combing through articles and leaving messages on survivor and domestic violence sites. It was just really hard because I really wanted her family to know that her, her pain wasn't in vain and that suffering really transformed into something beautiful and eloquent for other people and that she was going to prompt this discussion. And it did for me. It got me thinking about how violence perpetrated against black women brings no cause for alarm, primarily because, as a friend recently told me, no one is surprised by our deaths. No one is appalled by the physical and sexual abuse we receive, no matter who's behind it. There is nothing out of the ordinary about our victimization. Our bodies have been a place where harm and violence is inflicted, and we either survive or we don't. End of discussion. And as Travis says, we're the ones who take the blame. Because it prevents us from having to deal with the real problem, which is what are we doing as a society, as a community, as an individual to really combat this? And it's not going to be easy. I'm back with Kimberly Smith at the park for Community Paint Day. The sun provides plenty of light and warmth, and a large garden proudly displays an abundance of greens, lavender, and other plants and vegetables grown here. The park's booming with chatter and laughter from adults and children who come to add color to paint-by-number panels provided by her resilience artist. Each brushstroke is an act of love, a memory carefully spread across the wooden canvas. Smith occasionally visits the garden to get away, but on this beautiful Saturday afternoon, she's found something more than silence and solitude. She's found an artistic paradise for healing. When I was able to grab that brush and walk up to that, that, that outsketch of a woman, I was able to channel all of that energy from the abuse I suffered and the black eyes I had to cover up and the police not believing that I was I was a woman and I just I was harmed and I wasn't a streetwalker, I wasn't a drug addict. And I was able to put it all through that brush and make a beautiful woman that I know is me. Because I love me. I love me some me too. And I'm ready to engage in a dialogue about how to end this seemingly routine and even acceptable practice of violence against black women. I'm hoping you will join me. From Oakland, California, I'm Rochelle Robinson for Making Contact. To join that conversation, visit our website, radioproject.org. That's also where you can find more about Rochelle's personal story and the Her Resilience Project. Unfortunately, these stories often don't make it into the major news cycle. In the 1980s in South Los Angeles, more than a dozen black women were murdered. Many of these women's bodies were found in parks, alleyways, and dumpsters. And it's believed somewhere between three and five different serial killers were targeting the South L.A. community in the 80s and 90s. One suspect, Lonnie Franklin Jr., the so-called grim sleeper, is facing 10 counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. Chester Turner has already been convicted for killing 14 women. As these murders continued for three decades, Margaret Prescott and her group, the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders, were the few people to warn community members. Laura, you talked to Margaret. I did. She's featured in a documentary by British filmmaker Nick Broomfield called Tales of the Grim Sleeper. She talked to me about what it was like trying to get the LAPD and the city to take the murders seriously. You felt like a sitting duck. You're a black woman, you're out there, somebody's hunting you down, you don't have the information. There are other black women out there, other members of the community who need to know what's going on. 
I remember actually seeing a, a very, very short clip on television of the announcement of, of 11 women being killed. And I immediately called up some of my other activist sisters and we gathered a group of us to go down to LAPD. And that was really the beginning of our work as the Black Coalition fighting back serial murders. We were outraged by the fact that 11 women were already victims of a serial killer in a 40 mile radius in the black community of South Los Angeles before Los Angeles Police Department even announced that there was a serial murderer loose. We went down to LAPD to find out what was going on and um, what was being done about it and why the delay in informing the community. We were told, well, why are you concerned about it? He's only killing hookers, which turned out not to be the case, actually. And even if the women were all sex workers, these are not throwaway women. You know, there are some mother's daughter, some of them are mothers, and it's outrageous to have this kind of devaluation of human life. We kept getting reports from people in the community when bodies of black women were found. Schoolyards, alleyway, the Los Angeles Times occasionally. By the end of the 1980s, our count was about 90 women. And LAPD at that time were only admitting to about 18. The number had increased, you know, to 18. Now, a lot of information was being withheld from us as well, which we learned in Nick Broomfield's work with Tales of the Grim Sleeper, his research team, they were able to dig up information. For example, we pressed LAPD to release a composite sketch, which they did not want to do. When they finally, under pressure, released it, we found out that that composite they had gotten from a survivor, Anitra Washington, that had given them a description. They didn't release it for 22 years. Police say this is the face of a serial killer who's been roaming the streets of South Los Angeles since 1985. There have been at least 11 victims, all African American, most of them young women. The sketches are based on the description given by a woman who was brutally assaulted by the man in 1988. Police believe she is the only survivor. It was a 911 call of somebody calling in where the body of Barbara Ware was found. All right, report a uh, uh, murder or a dead body or something. The address is 1346 East 56th Street in the alley. The guy that dropped the off was driving a white and blue Dodge van, 1TZ. What's your name? Oh, I don't stand for nothing. <laughs> I know too many people. Okay, then, bye-bye. That 911 call was not released to the community for another 22 years. Family members were not informed. Some of them found out by watching television 10, 20 years later that their daughter was a victim of the serial killer. What other community? Uh, a wealthy community would that happen and we're finding out that there were pockets of other impoverished areas in Cleveland Ohio and in other parts of the country where we have had similar serial killings of, of women going unreported and in Canada indigenous women 1500 indigenous women who have gone missing uh, since the mid 1980s and believed to have been murdered and their murders are also treated with the same kind of disregard of this hierarchy of human human life where if you are a woman of color and you're impoverished, you're at the very bottom and your life is seen as not worth anything. We don't know all of what happened in law enforcement. I mean, come on, it's a 40 mile radius in South LA. You have that many women being murdered. You have that many women disappearing. You've got a suspect in custody who worked for LAPD as a mechanic, who worked for the city at a dump site in the sanitation department. When the suspect, Lonnie Franklin, clearly a suspect is innocent until proven guilty. When he was arrested, they found photos of about 180 black women in his house. Frankly, some of them looked like they were already dead. Detective Dennis Kilcoyne of the LAPD's robbery homicide unit says all of these images were taken from the home of Lonnie Franklin Jr., the man suspected to be the grim sleeper serial killer. We searched every nook and cranny of this residence and the big... Uh, a commercial building that he had in the backyard, vehicles, glove boxes, you know, under seats, the, everywhere. We gathered cameras, uh, videos, and all types of stuff from 
all over the, the property. We are dealing with probably decades of photography by this guy. A grandmother contacted me and said, well, her granddaughter was in one of those photos, but she disappeared. Just one day, they just never heard from her again. No body was found. She left two children behind. And they suspect that she's one of the victims whose bodies just never were found. So we may never know how many women have actually died. Over the years, since the mid-1980s, we gave out so much information. I mean, tens of thousands of flyers, teams of people out going on the strip where women worked, going in the middle of the night, giving information out to people, going to different communities, standing outside of supermarkets, etc. I was at a meeting soon after the whole story broke, and a young man got up and he held a flyer in his hand that was yellowing, it was that old. And he said, my mother was a victim and she was found in Jesse Owens Park. She was a hairdresser. And the flyer he had in his hand was one that we had given out, had my home phone number on it. He had kept it all of these years. You know, when you keep something that's old and it's kind of folded clearly in a safe place, that's how precious that flyer, that piece of information was to him. He held it up as he was making his point to say, look, you, something has to be done. There has to be justice in my mother's death. The work that we're doing is really useful in that way and giving power to those whose voice had not been heard and whose voice had been silenced or who were so perhaps embarrassed at the way the victims were portrayed in the media that they were just afraid to say anything and, and come out. What would friends and neighbor and people you sing in the church choir with think? And it's that whole mantle of respectability. I had approached a, a prominent minister black minister a body was found uh, just a few blocks in an alley down from his church and he said to me Margaret there's a moral issue involved he didn't mean that a woman was killed he meant that she was a prostitute and that's the kind of thing we have to cut through and and I think we are beginning to cut through that I think there is a shift now I think Ferguson in a lot of ways led that shift. You know, you could besmirch the character of the person who has been killed, but we will stand nevertheless and demand justice and say that black lives matter. And we say black women's lives count, black women's lives matter. So we're not gonna back off, you know, when you say, well, somebody is just some street person and who cares. We care about each and every one of them. They too are victims not only of, of a killer, but of an entire system and society that has devalued them, where to the degree some of them ended up impoverished and on the street. After the break, we'll head to the Yucatan, where many indigenous women face an insensitive healthcare system, putting their lives at risk. We'll be right back. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. Because of generous support from listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, Australia, and South Africa. To find out how to download shows or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. We've been listening to stories about black women whose murders are largely ignored by society and in many cases by those that are supposed to protect them. Jasmine, you found something similar happening in Mexico. I did. In Mexico, an indigenous woman is three times more likely to die during childbirth or postpartum than a non-indigenous woman. Both culture and government policies play a role in the violation of their rights, which often leads to death. So reporter Karen Tenorio and I went to the Yucatan to find out more. In the center of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, the sun is rising for what will be another humid 90-degree day in Xanla. Xanla is a rural Maya pueblo in the municipality of Chancón. Here is where you'll find Ney and Paro Cime as they are home. We have this granado. I'm going to remove the corn kernels from the cob. They've been picked at. That's why I'm choosing the good ones. Ney sits on a hammock in her kitchen and scrapes kernels from a corn cob. 
The kitchen is a traditional Mayan house, an oblong structure with a stone foundation, reeds, and a thatched roof. As Nei removes the kernels to ground into dough, she sits on a hammock exactly where she gave birth to most of her children. When I had my first daughter, she was born in my mother-in-law's house. I lived in my mother-in-law's house for three years. Later, I got this house, and I had the rest of my children here, minus the youngest daughter. Nei had five children in her home with the help of her partera, a midwife. Traditional Mayan midwifery dates back several centuries, but that tradition is being challenged. In the past, it wasn't like it is today. We'd feel the pain and the midwife would examine you and tell you if it was almost time. When we would give birth here, my sister-in-law, my mother-in-law, my mother and the midwife would come together to welcome the child. In the hospitals, it's very difficult. Over there, you're just laying in the bed. The doctors are gone attending others. Here you have your mom, your family. Pregnant women that receive economic support from government programs such as Prospera are required to seek attention in government health clinics. Many midwives aren't recognized or respected by medical staff in hospitals and are forbidden from assisting women unless they're trained and certified. But that isn't easy. Five of my children were with a midwife, just the last girl I had in the hospital. My midwife helped at the start, but the doctor said that I was at high risk because of my age. I was 43 when I was going to give birth to the girl. When the midwife was gathering her things for the birth, the doctor asked, Who are you attending? Mrs. Nay, she said. They said no. She told me, Look, the doctors say that I can't see you, that if I care for you, I'll be responsible for what might happen. Porque dice el doctor que si yo te atiendo, soy responsable a lo que vaya a pasar. Nay had to give birth without the assistance of her midwife. But first she had to be examined at her local health clinic. Then she had to drive to the hospital she was assigned to. Once there, the pain was so extreme that she couldn't walk. There was no time to spare. Y en Cagua me pasaron con en la clínica para que me hagan un chequeo. I made it to Cagua to get checked and they said I was about to give birth. And there, my daughter was born. She was born normal, six normal births. I didn't have complications, I didn't have anything. No tuve complicaciones, no tuve nada. Many rural indigenous women receiving Prospera support are assigned to deliver their children in hospitals that are often over an hour away. For example, in the community of Chanchichimila, they don't have access to a clinic in the community. It doesn't exist. They only have a center with a health worker. So when a woman is about to give birth, the child doesn't say, here I come. No, it's a moment where it will just come. So there is an adequate attention where they have control. They have to go from Chanchichimila to Chiquinzonot, where they perform an examination. From there, they are sent to Valladolid. So there's the issue of the mother's life being at risk, the child. That's Mijna Araceli. She's Nei's daughter-in-law, and she established the project Safe Maternity for the Indigenous Population in East Yucatan. After witnessing numerous cases of medical negligence of pregnant women in their community, this negligence and mistreatment of women is known as obstetric violence. It includes being verbally abused, forcibly examined, and coerced into surgery and permanent birth control. Existe mucha violencia obstétrica. There's a lot of obstetric violence, and often women from indigenous communities don't recognize it. One can tell them anything and it will be accepted as normal. When in reality, you're violating her rights, and then in other circumstances, there's maternal mortality. Because of this, Mijna holds workshops with women and youth so that they can take control of their sexual and reproductive rights. Waseguro Popular, Mexico's universal health care system, and Prospera are supposed to be a safety net for the poor, there aren't enough doctors, beds, or hospitals to provide adequate care. On occasion, there have been deaths in the community and in other communities. Because there isn't rapid transportation to get them out, in the centers, they have equipment, but not to give birth. And though it's more costly for the government to perform a cesarean than a vaginal birth, hospitals have to perform births quickly, and the option is often a cesarean, tripling the risk of death or illness for the mother and increasing the risk of the infant having respiratory problems. The Yucatan is among the five states in Mexico with the most C-sections. 
Nay's daughter also had to have a C-section that she believes could have been prevented. I have a daughter that is mother to this boy. When I took her to the hospital, it was a Thursday evening. She had started having contractions. The doctor examined her and said she needed to dilate further so she should go home. No, I'm not leaving, she said. She stayed, and on Saturday at about 7 in the morning, the doctor called me and said, Ma'am, your daughter needs a cesarean. The baby is about to die. Its fluids have dried out. So I said, Doctor, if I admitted my daughter on Thursday evening, why hasn't anything been done for her? He just said, we needed ultrasounds. I said, Doctor, my daughter arrived with all of her paperwork, including the ultrasounds. He said, you know what, ma'am, please excuse me because I'm just getting in. I don't know what happened with the other doctors. I said, fine, I'll sign the paperwork, but you need to act fast. Three days after she gave birth, they released her from the hospital and we went home to rest. I took her, but the same night that she was released from the hospital, she got a fever. She was burning up. I told my son-in-law, my daughter isn't doing well. We need to take her back to the hospital. She shouldn't have a fever unless they treated her improperly. They said they had to clean her again, that they may have left some of the placenta behind. The next day she was released again, and that's this little boy that's grown now. Yes, that's Emiliano. Yes, cuando es este niño que ya está grande, Sí, es Emiliano. Later in Nay's kitchen, the family gathers just before dinner. Mother-in-law, do I give this to the chickens? Yes, give that to the chickens. Mirna chops radishes and other vegetables for the meal. She and her husband, Jose Antonio, live separately with their daughter, but Nay's kitchen is the central gathering place for the family. Jose Antonio tends to their daughter on the hammock. Jose Antonio says that Mirna's work has inspired change in the family. While Mirna was once expected to focus her attention solely on the care of her home and child, she now works outside of the home and has his support in that of the family. Like on many other occasions, Jose Antonio holds off on his work in the family's maize field to drive Mijna to a workshop. He's a trained school teacher and says he sees the importance and change that her work is creating among women in the community, but especially among its youth. In a classroom in Shankon, a group of teens gather in a circle with Mijna. They have worked together to understand and identify gender issues and myths around sexuality in a space where they feel safe enough to speak openly about them. They share what they feel are advantages and disadvantages of being men or women in their community. So you're telling me that a disadvantage is that men have a power over women. Why do you say that? Because, like we have mentioned it, there is violence in some families. Women are seen as weaker in a relationship. Okay, Diego is saying something very interesting. He's saying that one disadvantage is that women suffer violence. And we were talking about violence. Midna continues going around the circle of teens, each student identifying issues that they weren't able to articulate or connect to their own experiences until now. She hopes that with this and future generations, the communities of Chancom, Shenla, and Chiquin Sonot will come to recognize the human rights of indigenous women. For Making Contact, I'm Jasmine Lopez. That report was produced in collaboration with reporter Garen Tenorio. And that's it for this edition of Making Contact. Special thanks to the Mary Wolford Foundation for partial funding for this program. To find out more, visit our website at radioproject.org. Resistance! 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 Activists are shouting that today, like they have for nearly 68 years on our airwaves. The history of KPFA is connected to the history of resistance in America. From the McCarthy hearings to anti-war and civil rights movements, to today's voices speaking truth to power for our community's rights, health, and welfare. Join the celebration of KPFA's 68th birthday, Friday, April 14th, as we showcase our history with archival voices of folks like James Baldwin, Gore Vidal, 
Paul Robeson, Studs Terkel, and Rosa Parks, just to name a few. KPFA has been the platform for resistance, giving power to your voice, the people, on vital issues. Support our 68th year of resistance, Friday, April.